right, well, I'll start off by saying welcome to the NOFA Vermont 39th Annual Winter Conference and the kickoff to our 50th, 50th anniversary. NOFA Vermont was formed 50 years ago by a group of farmers who believed that farming could be done differently. And over this month of the conference, we are reflecting on who we have been and what challenges we might face in the next 50 years. We've been asking, what might we be asked um, to do to do over the next half century, how will we respond and deepen our commitments to our place and each other? We're so glad you are here with us to join in and in the work of finding a path to just and resilient farming future. This is the workshop Hoop House Growing Success in the Shoulder Season. My name is Colleen Reed and I am an organic inspector at VOF. <laughs> Before we get started with the workshop, we wanted to take a few minutes to provide a short intro to our work. Our mission is to promote organic practices, to build an economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just agriculture system in Vermont that benefits all living things. We believe everyone has a role to play in creating a more equitable and resilient food system with joyful and vibrant agricultural communities at its heart. At NOFA Vermont, we build programs to serve as bridges from the world we have now towards the world we need. In our work, we certify the state's organic farms and food producers, provide farmer services like technical assistance, training and education for farmers at all stages of their business development, raise awareness for eaters and community members about how to access and grow good food. We advocate on the state and national levels for small and medium scale farmers and farm workers voices to be heard and supported. We offer a suite of food access programs to ensure that all people in Vermont can enjoy organic food. We lead farm to school connections and programming, build community engagement programs to help develop agricultural awareness and celebration all over Vermont. We travel the state with our mobile pizza oven to build community and share meals and much, much more. All right, next slide. Next, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors. Our sponsors are an integral part of the success of the Winter Conference and their support is a key ingredient for the growth of this movement. We encourage you to learn more about our sponsors on our website and show them some love. So we'll share this link in the chat. We want to especially thank our cultivar, nourisher, nurturer, and grower level sponsors listed here. Again, we hope you'll visit our website to learn more about these sponsors. And for this workshop in particular, we have a short message from one of our sponsors. You wanna help me with that, Kayla? Yep. Thank you. My name is Soyla and I am a solar advisor at Sun Commons. I wanted to chat with you about climate resilience on the homestead. So much of your homestead is already powered by the sun. So why not add solar to make sure that the electricity is also powered by the sun? We have several different options for homesteaders and for farms to go solar. Go to our website and check it out. Give us a call and we'd love to chat with you about how to go solar. All right, moving along here. All of you are integral to our movement too. NOFA Vermont is a membership organization and your membership adds power and voice to our movement. We hope that if you're not already a member, you will join us today. To learn more, visit the link that Kayla is gonna put in the chat for you as well. All right, next slide. Now last, before we get started, as you saw in the email earlier this week with links to access workshops, we'd like to raise up the workshop agreements also shared on the screen here. Please take a moment to review these. A few more logistics that I'll have that I want to share are if you have any tech related questions, please add them to the chat box and we'll work as fast as we can to get your questions answered. If something comes up and you need to leave, we will be recording this workshop 
and the recording will be shared with all registrants so you can watch it another time. If you have any questions during the workshop, please put them into the chat box. We're going to do our best to answer them as they're relevant throughout um, our presenters um, session. And we'd also like to encourage you to engage back and forth in the chat box. All right. And with that, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Ryan Fitzbeauchamp um, of Evening Song Farm. And yeah, he said he would like to introduce himself to you. So I'll leave it to him. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Kayla. And um, thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I'm just, I guess one thing I wanted to say after that introduction briefly is just how uh, grateful I feel to be part of the NOFA Vermont community. And I've always been really impressed at the vision and the extent of what NOFA does under its umbrella. And I, I think it's just, um, we're all so lucky to have uh, NOFA um, to bring us together and to do so much good work on our behalf. Um, so let me share my screen to um, pull up my presentation. Um, So uh, my wife, Kara, and I run Evening Song Farm. I think my slides will load in just a minute. Uh, we run Evening Song Farm in Shrewsbury, Vermont. Uh, we've been in this location for, uh, since 2012. And that's a, the, uh, 2012 is our first year really growing winter greens. Um, I saw in the chat box uh, people's comments in there. It seems like there's a, a broad range of experience levels and uh, some farms on there who have even been growing winter greens for longer than we have. Um, so I really welcome everybody, as Colleen said, to continue using the chat box for any questions that come up. I won't be able to see those questions, but um, I'll take some breaks and uh, Colleen will feel free to jump in if there's any, uh, any questions that, um, that would be good to clarify earlier. Um, and similarly, uh, it's, I'm really excited to have some farms in here who have a lot of experience with winter greens. And I hope that um, any things that you might do differently or other little tips that, that you might have to share that are something different or in addition to what I've covered here, I hope, I hope you'll feel free to add those in to add to everyone's, add to what everyone takes away from this. So a quick uh, overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll give a little introduction of our farm um, a basic overview of hoop house, um, hoop house green production in the shoulder seasons. I'll talk about some challenges of winter green growing and how we have addressed those challenges in our farm, how we think about them. I'll share a lot of crop specific information from our farm, varieties, seeding dates, um, other tips for uh, crop by crop winter production. And then um, for uh, new growers, I hope that this will be an overview that uh, doesn't leave any big uh, big pieces out. And I hope that experienced growers who are part of this, this conversation will um, have some pieces to add and maybe to have a, a one or two things to take away from it to, to try out on your farm. So here's a, a picture of our farm from a few years ago. It looks mostly like this now. Um, uh, we have one more high tunnel on the right hand side of the screen at the time we had two now we have a third one of the same size. We're in zone 4A so winter temperatures can reach uh, 20 below. Uh, we, our markets are um, primarily a CSA since the beginning of the pandemic we've, we've switched to most of our sales through CSA that runs year round except for a few, except for four weeks in January. We have some local wholesale sales to restaurants, other farm stands and grocery stores. Uh, we run our farm with five full-time summer employees and um, those same five employees stick around in the winter and work part-time one, uh, one to three days a week. And then we grow in three high tunnels that are 30 feet wide by 148 feet long. So I wanted to just give a very basic introduction to the um, the, the basics of winter green growing. Um, what well, we do in growing uh, you know, sh shoulder season greens in a hoop house is to grow in a structure that allows solar heat gain and protects from wind. Um, so this is a picture from inside one of our high tunnels. 
Uh, we select cold, hardy, fast growing greens and we seed them at the right time in the fall. Uh, or, and also we, we also do replanting in the spring and I guess in the winter in January through, through March. We protect greens from nighttime low temperatures by covering them with layers of row cover. And then we have uh, our late fall harvest of greens is November through January. There's very slow growth of these greens in December through mid-February. And then late February through April, the growth rate increases rapidly and there's a much bigger harvest potential as these plants are really putting on growth from one week to the next. It's in this time that greens begin to go to seed depending on what the greens are. And there's an opportunity to replant some greens in January through March for harvest in April or May. So this is kind of a visual tour of getting, a, getting our tunnels established and taking them through the winter. This is in late August or early September. You can see we're taking the tomato plants out of our tunnels and there's a few beds to the left where we've already uh, removed our summer crops and planted winter greens. In uh, late September, those beds, uh, you can see those greens have germinated in the, the two beds in the center. We've got some uh, lettuce and char that was transplanted in the beds in the right. And um, we're still, uh, looks like there's one more bed, one and a half more beds left to plant in this tunnel. In early October, the same uh, tunnel greens have grown a little bit more. By mid-October, the uh, lettuce has grown a little bit. Uh, there's some arugula on the second bed from the left. And then late November, uh, when everything has filled out, this is what we hope our tunnels look like around this time, um, because from November through February, there's not going to be, there's going to be very little growth in that time. So we're really trying to get, get the timing just right so that these greens reach full size by the end of November or early December. Um, this is a photograph of mid-February. This is lettuce plants that were harvested in November. And you can see uh, lettuce is especially slow to regrow. And um, this picture was taken just a few days ago on our farm and we're still waiting for that to, for those plants to regrow. Um, so just to illustrate the, the slowness of the growth from December through, through the middle of February. And then um, similarly, this picture, or I guess in contrast, this picture is in early April where you can see the two beds of lettuce on opposite sides of me um, have regrown quite vigorously. We've probably already harvested uh, this lettuce um, uh, once in the, you know, we've harvested it once in the fall and we've probably already gotten a second cutting in the spring and this may be, um, this may be a third cutting of that lettuce as it is really growing quickly in the spring. So this is another, um, a different tunnel with some different greens in there. Uh, this is, you know, you can see preparing these beds, the, the uh, parts of these beds for, um, for seeding. Uh, still the last of the cherry tomatoes coming out when this photo is taken um, in early October. And then on October 15th, uh, those greens are, uh, have germinated in there. Oops, let me see if I can go back. Um, so I wanted to share one basic principle of winter growing, which kind of helps think about what's going on in there and what control you have to get the outcome that you want. Matt, um, we have a question about the, the lettuce. Yes. Are you getting a second cutting from your lettuce? Um, and what varieties are you using that won't go get bitter? Yeah, I'll, I'll share all the variety information that I have um, I, that'll all be consolidated later. The lettuce we harvest once in the fall. Our goal for lettuce is to have it have it uh, reach maturity in um, in November or December. Harvest it, get it all harvested by early January, and then uh, keep it alive through the winter. Uh, we won't get any reharvest in the winter months, but in March or April it will regrow. And it doesn't. The varieties we grow don't. Uh, we don't have much of an. We don't have an issue with bitterness. Um, unlike summer growing, we can get we can get three, three cuttings of lettuce before uh, without, um, without any, uh, it, the last cutting is certainly not as good as the first, but um, having fresh lettuce in, in April, uh, it's, it's still really good. Uh, All right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll do my best to remember to stop and ask if any questions come up as well. Um, 
So I wanted to just kind of share this concept for winter growing of just understanding what factors influence plant growth. And our, I guess this is kind of based on my, our own observations and experience. But um, I would say that growth comes from a combination of light and heat. Heat meaning not just air temperature, but also soil temperature. And one of the ways that we can observe that on our farm is that greens will grow faster in late November than they will in late January, even though there's a, a similar amount of daylight in those times. And the reason for that is that there's a lot more heat in the soil in late November than there is in late January. And so this next one, this, this is a difficult slide to interpret, but I'll walk you through it. Um, there's two lines on this uh, chart, a gray line on top and an orange line on the bottom. The information in this is from some soil temperature sensors that Becky Madden installed from UVM Extension installed on our farm a few years ago. And what we were doing is looking at the difference of in soil temperature between a tunnel where we applied heat to the soil, uh, where we invested in um, some infrastructure to be able to warm the soil in that tunnel, compared to the soil temperature in a tunnel that was unheated. So if you look at the gray line on the top, what we were trying to do in here was to generally keep the soil in the range of 45 degrees. And so you can see these spikes um, going up, uh, up and down through that time. Um, this is kind of a silly question, but is my mouse visible on, can you see my mouse? Okay, sorry about that. Then it's been uh, kind of in the way unnecessarily, but now I can use it to point, to point out. So you can see these lines on here. Um, where the temperature goes up and down. Uh, the spikes in these lines is when we turned, when we uh, had our boiler putting heat in the soil and then the declines are when, um, when our boiler was off and the soil cooled down. So in this, in this tunnel, we, kept, we artificially kept the soil at that range. But the line that we'll be focusing on is this lower orange line because this is showing you what happens in the soil, what happens to soil temperature when you don't apply any heat to it. You just have it covered up with a layer of plastic and you're putting on and taking off a uh, row cover um, to keep the plants from getting too cold. So it was interesting to see, for me to see from this, um, this little arrow right here on November 30th, all the way to December 29th, um, the soil temperature mostly hovered around 40 degrees in that time. Um, and also around that time, there's maybe a, li a little more than nine hours of daylight in um, the end of November for us and a little less than the end of December, but it's pretty much hovering around nine hours of daylight. And then you can see in January, um, even though the daylight is increasing, you can see for the month of January, the soil temperature is going from 40 degrees kind of steadily down to 34 degrees in the beginning of February when there's uh, 10 hours of daylight. In this particular year, we got a little warm spell in the beginning of February and that uh, for three days or so of, of warm temperatures and, and bright sun. And that brought our soil temperature back up to 40 degrees. Um, and then, you know, soil temperature kind of hovered right around 40 degrees all the way until March 12th when there was one more warm spell and the soil got up to 48 degrees. And by that time in mid-March, there's 11, there's almost 12 hours of daylight then. And so I think this is just kind of to illustrate um, the relationship between daylight and soil temperature and plant growth. And, you know, so in the beginning when there's low daylight and um, temp soil temperature around 40 degrees, the greens will grow, are growing slowly. Um, but then, you know, in the month of January, when that soil temperature is going really down, there's just, there's not very much growth. And what we discovered is that even applying heat to the soil as we did in this um, tunnel up here, uh, that extra soil warmth did boost growth a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't terribly significant. Um, so, but then in, uh, by the time you get to mid-March and you know, when the soil temperatures are in the forties and when the daylight is, is close to 12 hours, that's when you can really expect to see, you know, when all those factors combine um, to really have, have the, the growth take off. Are there any questions that, that came up about that? Yeah, what is your heat source? 
The heat source that we used was a pellet boiler that we got used from another farm. And, um, and then we, that water is um, uh, plumbed into our tunnel and uh, piped in, in, pi in little loops underneath our beds. Great. We have some more questions about bitterness, sweetness, varieties, but I'm going to let you get to the section um, where we talk about varieties. That sounds good. Um, oh, this is uh, this is the same same slide I, I uh, gave before, indicating the slowness of growth in uh, December through through February. And then in contrast, this slide here is early April and you can see the, um, uh, there's these spinach plants here, scallions that we have interplanted among the spinach. The bed in the middle is a spring planting of spinach that we transplanted in there. But by this time in April, the spinach is just really taking off and um, it can be even difficult to, to keep up with it. So I wanted to share some opportunities of shoulder season greens. One of the things that um, is an opportunity for our farm is it's one of the, it gives us a real chance to focus intensively to achieve high production in a small space. Um, so we're really like, instead of the summer where we're growing a lot of things outside, we're really bringing our attention just to these three tunnels that we have. And it's a really small space to manage and focus on and gives us an opportunity to really try to get it right um, and to try to control as many factors as we can. And, um, really manage it well. And similar to that, it gives you the opportunity to farm with biological processes in slow motion. So in contrast to the summer when things are just going by so quickly, um, you know, what a friend of ours uh, joked one time that they wished that farmers could, could uh, take a time out and just kind of in the summer, just pause all the biological processes that are happening and take a vacation and come back just to where things are. And you can't do that in the summer, but you kind of can do that in the winter um, uh, to, uh, you know, because the, the growth and because everything is just so slowed down. And then um, of course, there's such high demand for winter greens and uh, community support, I think is another big one, especially as a CSA farm. It's just something that really people just think it's so cool that you can harvest greens in the winter, especially without any supplement or with very little, little if any supplemental sources of heat. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's a good way to uh, kind of get your farm's name out in the community and for uh, people to, it's easier, I think, for people to have a sense of um, awe about what you're doing. So challenges of shoulder season greens. I made a little graphic to, um, to share this. The circle in the middle, hoop house growing success in the shoulder seasons. That indicates what uh, kind of, if everything goes right, um, that's the success that you get to enjoy. However, there are things that can go wrong, uh, such as having the right planting dates. Uh, if you get those planting dates wrong uh, in the fall, then there's, um, you miss out on, on a, a huge opportunity to harvest greens, you know, a little bit late or a little bit early and um, or a little bit late and you won't be able to harvest them a little bit early and they'll be ready and maybe over mature um, before you're ready for them. Germination is another issue because the planting dates are so specific in the spring or sorry in the fall. If you have any germination issues then um, you don't have you don't really have a chance to replant the same crop. If you plant something and find that it germinated poorly uh, planting it again by the time you find out of that poor germination you've missed the chance to, to hit that right planting window. Pests are another one. Um, like outdoor growing, there's pests that are uh, an issue for growing winter greens and need to be managed appropriately. Weed control is another one. The, one of the things with winter greens is that most growers who are doing it are um, growing winter greens uh, in the season that they're not growing summer crops. And so generally there's a pretty tight turnaround where you're taking tomatoes or other summer crops out of the tunnel, getting winter greens in the ground. And that sets up the perfect conditions for certain species of weeds who thrive under those management techniques. And so a couple years of poor uh, weed control, you, you may find that in that tight turnaround window when you get your greens established, there's a whole lot of weed seeds, a winter annual weed seeds that are coming up as well. That can really be an issue for these um, 
these tiny greens that, uh, that are harvested and going into salad mix. Disease is another issue. Uh, this can, um, the hoop house has particular environmental conditions that I'll describe that make disease management particularly challenging. Cold damage is another uh, another factor that can uh, that needs to be managed and um, and can be difficult, especially because the because you're going through the winter and um, the you know the weather is what it is. Um, so I'll, I'll go into more detail for all of these, and then the last one is operator error. So. Um, there are, there's, I mean, just like summer growing, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of easy ways to, to make mistakes in winter growing. I think one of the things that we found in winter growing is that it's, in, in some ways, it's a little less forgiving than summer growing, um, and the mistakes have um, bigger consequences. Maybe if, um, and a big part of that is just because you are growing in such a smaller area, and you don't have, uh, you know, it's a bigger percentage of of what you're growing. It's not like one crop in the summer where you can lose a crop, but you also have dozens of other crops out in the field. So talking about right planting dates, I'll go into um, the, oops, I'll go into the, um, the, the planting dates that we use. I think I intended to put a picture on here that didn't make it, but, um, but I wanted the picture would have shown uh, some greens that we have. I just took a picture a day ago, and it was just some kale, some baby kale that we have on our farm that we still haven't harvested yet. And if I, it was a new crop for us, so I was experiment. You know, I took my best guess for when to seed it, but it took a little longer to grow than I than I thought it would. And so I, I'm confident had I seeded it four or five days earlier, we could have gotten our first cutting of that uh, in November or December. And, uh, and we could have been getting regrowth in a few weeks rather than getting our first cutting in a few weeks. So germination was the next one. You can see where that arrow is pointing. This is some arugula that we had growing. And the, um, you can see those spots of germination. The issue that we had here is that we seeded our arugula and um, we seeded it into moist soil. I'm used to planting arugula in moist soil, out, in moist soil outside and having it germinate really easily. But there's different soil conditions in our high tunnels and in, in most high tunnels that um, are in operation for a few years, salts that build up in the soil because they don't have an opportunity to get flushed out. I found that just seeding that arugula in moist soil and not watering it gave me these big gaps in germination. And so this next slide right here, this is that same bed of arugula after it's been harvested. You can see that it looks like it's filled in really nicely. If you look up close up at the top of the bed, there's um, some, you can see there's some lettuce that's planted way up top. What we ended up doing is actually plucking arugula out of this bed and filling in those gaps so that we had a good stand of it. Uh, it worked, but it took us a lot of time to do it. Um, and so some of the tips that we've learned for successfully germinating, the first one is to water thoroughly after summer crops to flush salts from the soil. Um, so this you know, can ideally, I suppose that is before you plant winter greens. Um, but if not, uh, when you're planting is um, is the next best. Avoid over fertilizing in fall. Um, the more you know, putting more fertilizer on a bed and seeding into it will um, may end up you may end up with spotty germination. And then plant backup seed, seedlings in trays that can be transplanted in gaps. Um, this is something that we've kind of just learned recently or just started doing recently as we tend to have these germination issues. It can save us, you know, it's, um, it's just a good backup to have some trays that you, can, that you can fill in gaps if you need to. Any other questions, Colleen, that have come in that might be good to answer now? I think you're gonna move on to pest soon, right? That's right. Okay, then let's hold them until okay, then. Sounds good. And then the last one is to keep wiggle room for later seeded crops as a backup. Sometimes what we end up doing if we have poor germination is, um, you know, by, like I said, by the time we notice that we have poor germination, 
we've lost the window of opportunity to reseed that, that crop. But there might be some later seeded crops that we can fill in that gap. And so if we, you know, one of the things I always think about if we end up with poor germination is, is there another crop that I can seed later that I'll have a market for that I can do instead? So weed control. Um, this photograph here, if you look closely at the two beds of lettuce in the foreground, you can see that, um, you know, we seeded these and they need to be weeded. Um, and this picture here shows Tokyo Bicana, a mustard green growing with some chickweed in the understory. Um, chickweed is this particularly challenging weed for winter growing because it really thrives in the conditions that our winter greens do. Uh, disturbing the soil in September, giving it a lot of water, and then um, not doing a whole lot of soil disturbance after that. Um, it can really build up populations of uh, chickweed seeds in the soil. And so what we realized as you know, the first few years we managed our winter greens, we kind of had a hands-off approach uh, and used our time elsewhere, tried to kind of get by with as minimal input as we could. And after a few years of that, we had more and more weed pressure build up. And then when we started really hiring employees to do a lot of the work in our tunnels, we realized that it, um, the uh, dollars and cents worked out a lot better to try to manage our tunnels as precisely as possible to keep, uh, keep weeds from going to seed and um, to try to have a really clean crop that we didn't have to pick out a whole bunch of weeds from. So some of the concepts that we've developed for winter, for uh, weed management in winter tunnels. For establishment, uh, plan weed killing times and crop establishment periods one to two weeks out. Look ahead towards seeding transplanting dates and take the tunnel through dry periods where weeds can be killed. So I think one of the things, one of the ways I think about that is um, depending on how we're watering our tunnels, we're either creating an environment where it's easy for plants to be killed or where it's very hard for plants to be killed. And when we're uh, seeding in our tunnel and transplanting in our tunnel, we wanna create an environment where it's hard for plants to be killed. So we're putting a lot of water irrigation on there. Um, it can be really hot in September when we're transplanting crops and we need to, um, we're often irrigating even a couple times a day to keep moisture on the leaves after transplanting. And when we're trying to establish crops like that, that's a bad time to also be trying to um, take care of small weeds that are just starting to germinate. So what we try to do is we try to look ahead a little bit and think, is this, you know, where are our crop establishment times going to be? Like, you know, we're gonna be transplanting and seeding in another week. So this is our time to focus on weed control when we don't need to be turning any irrigation on in that tunnel. And um, it's really helpful for us to remember that and think about it ahead of time, because otherwise we get to a point where we'd really like to be killing these weeds, but we're also trying to have our transplants survive in the soil. And it um, makes it more challenging to try to do both of those at the same time. So another one, another concept that we try to do is to take advantage of opportunities to stale seedbed. And really the opportunity for this is if you have a summer crop that is all done before you need to transplant any uh, winter greens in there. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes things like, uh, I'm trying to think of what, um, we, you know, we've grown zucchini or green beans in our tunnels, um, which, finish a lot earlier. We've also, I guess this year we started growing some carrots and beets uh, very early in our tunnels and those are those are out out very early as well. Um, so for crops like that that comes out of the tunnel and we have a few weeks or longer maybe before we need to be transplanting and that's a really good opportunity to try to flush weed seeds from that soil. So getting water on those beds um, and either covering them with a tarp or uh, disturbing the soil to kill the germinating weed seeds. Invest early in weed seed prevention, multi-year perspective necessary to avoid weed seed production in tunnels. And so I think what we're kind of thinking of with this is to the extent that we can, if we can, um, if I can 
pay our crew to do the work to take weeds out of our, out of our tunnels, it's going to be saving us a lot of work in future years when we're not when we may have a lower weed seed bank, um, and we're not going to be, have to rescue weed as many crops. Um, so I think I used to try to be a little more frugal with that and try to just kind of do the bare minimum to get the crop out of the ground. And I've shifted my perspective a little bit to think that it can be worthwhile to hire a crew to um, do a really good job keeping these tunnels clean. And then for harvesting, when, when we harvest, I always have our crew remove weeds as they go uh, when it's possible to do that if we're not really in a rush. And the weeds will reroot easily in the cool conditions of a winter high tunnel. So uh, we generally have them pile up those weeds and remove them from the tunnel. And then for the winter lull, there's really uh, the biological processes are so slow in January and early February that we try to take advantage of that period to really get the, um, to t pull out all of the little chickweeds like this um, so that we have as little pressure as we can into the spring. Because I know that when we get into that fast growth period, the weeds are gonna take out, take off and the chickweed will have a very fibrous root system and it'll be almost impossible to, to get it out later. So the chance we have is, um, you know, the window of opportunity dries up after, uh, after February. Um, and then let's see, the last one is uh, let it go or let it go and see what happens. Um, it's, uh, it's another management technique that, that may work is to grow crops that don't, uh, that can compete with weeds. Um, things like bunched kale um, and another neat opportunity that some, a lot more farms seem to be doing now is steaming their soils for weed control, uh, buying a soil steamer and applying a lot of heat to the, uh, the top of the soil. There's been some neat, neat results that I've seen from other farms doing that. Uh, so here's a photograph of um, some weed control in action. On the bottom, there's a wheel hoe uh, that we use to keep our pathways clean. And then our employee Taylor is, is going through the bok choy um, with, a, with a hoe, taking out any little germinating weeds in that, in that understory. So disease, uh, doesn't this picture make you wanna grow winter greens? This is, um, uh, I, I believe, botrytis on lettuce and um, disease is very challenging for managing greens through the winter. And that's because of the environmental conditions of the winter hoop house. So this is an environment, this is a tunnel that we have all covered up to protect the plants from cold. It's an environment with very little airflow with very high humidity. There is dense plantings of crops under there and there's periods of prolonged condensation on leaf surfaces. So, you know, it's, it's like a big plastic box um, with a wet sponge on the bottom of it covered up with, uh, with a blanket. Um, so all of this, these conditions are really favorable for uh, disease on plants and so it's really important to take advantage of all the opportunities we have to, um, to help our plants get through the winter um, in this challenging environment for disease. So one of the things that I think about is in winter growing is the trade-off in high density plantings. This, these are some mustard greens that we seeded very densely. And high density plantings are great because they have a high yield potential but a crop like this also has a very short harvest window. And so if you have like greens that are this dense in uh, December, you're not gonna be, uh, at least we aren't able to have those in our tunnel um, and kind of let them sit there until we're ready to harvest them in January. So some lettuce like this, um, this is like great looking lettuce in late November, or early December. But when I see lettuce like this, I think about I think how quickly I'm able to harvest it because there's so little airflow among those leaves and um, uh, and they're just, it's going to go, it won't last very long before um, there's really a lot of disease pressure in those plants. Any questions that have come up, Colleen? Yes, um, someone asked about harvesting chickweed um, because it's excellent for thyroid. Um, see if you've thought about that. I like munching on chickweed when I'm in the tunnel. 
but uh, but we haven't added it to anything or tried to market it. Fortunately, we don't have um, we don't have that much chickweed pressure. I've seen some other farms tunnels where it's um, is where it's really a, uh, it can grow in very thickly, and um, that's what we want to do our best to to avoid getting to that point. And then we have a question. Um, what about the wire you are using? Can you talk about that? Um, and I don't know if we need to clarify um, with Lee, um, but the wire that I'm seeing that might need explanation is um, for the remake. Yeah, it's probably these hoops right here. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about that when we, when we get into cold temperatures and, and covering with real cover. Great. And when you talk about pests, um, we have a question about um, aphids. So okay, perfect. Yeah, if you could touch on that, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. So I uh, put together, or I kind of consolidated our ideas for a, our disease management toolbox. And the first phase of that is in the establishment phase when we're getting crops uh, established in our tunnels in the months of, I guess, really September through November. Um, I guess the starting point is, if possible, to grow disease resistant varieties. Uh, there's diseases of lettuce and spinach for which resistance is really effective. Um, not all diseases are, it's not a tool that you can use for all diseases, but certain ones you can, and that's, um, that's a really great tool to be able to use for those. Um, I guess I should, maybe I should say more specifically, for lettuce, uh, there's uh, seems to be really effective downy mildew resistance, and same for spinach. Um, there's varieties that are bred for high resistance to downy mildew, um, and maybe uh, there, maybe some other folks can can chime in if anyone uh, is aware of other kind of disease resistance that's specifically bred into varieties that can be a good choice for for those diseases. The next one is to plant at appropriate density for a harvest plan. So this photograph right here. Um, you know, there's like the lettuce in the foreground and then some uh, germinating mustard greens in the background. And that's planted at a very high density. And um, so it's okay to do that, but I just need to know that I need to get that, I need to plan on being able to harvest that right when it's ready very quickly, uh, rather than having that sit in our tunnel for weeks and weeks to kind of slowly pick away at it. If I wanna do that to um, kind of extend a harvest into January, then I would need to plant um, at, at less density in, in our experience. And then after crop establishment, we stop watering around November 1st. So we are putting a lot of putting as much water as we think we need to to get the plants established and growing well. And then we uh, have a hard cutoff of November 1st where we're not putting any more water in our tunnels to try to keep the top of the soil as dry as possible. So that way when we have these plants in the tunnel covered up with row cover. There's not there's not so much extra moisture right there on the surface to uh, to raise the humidity, and we can have a little um, little layer of, of dry soil on the top. And then we keep the sides rolled up as much as possible without risking tissue damage on our plants from freezing. So the more airflow that we can get in here um, in the establishment period, the better for disease management. And then similarly, we keep the row covers off as much as possible, except when we need to, to protect the plant tissue from damage. So in the fall, you know, we might, even when it's like, you know, 30, might, we might have a night of 30 degrees or so, or even 28 degrees, and we might even leave our sides up in those conditions just to kind of um, keep the air moving through there, uh, as long as we're not concerned about damaging our plants from cold. And then, um, the next step is what I call the crop maintenance phase of December through early February. So in this picture, there's um, these two end wall vents that are pointed to in our tunnels. And we found that the, the bigger, you know, we, we wanna have big vents in there so that we can um, keep air flowing through our tunnels rather than having that humid air just sit in there. Um, so maximize tunnel ventilation through roll up sides and end wall ventilation when doing so will not risk cold damage to plants. So. The, what we try to do is have as much ventilation as possible um, as long as we're not gonna have our, have our plants get damaged. And then, 
use sufficient row cover and supplemental heat to prevent crop tissue damage. This I find is really important because um, our experience is that damaged uh, plants will uh, really help disease, encourage the spread of disease. So if we have leaves that are freezing or um, you know plants that plants that die from exposure to cold, then we have this this wet soppy tissue there and plants that aren't really able to defend that tissue against disease. Um, so as much as we can prevent plants from um, having tissue die from cold, uh, that that really helps uh, in our experience with disease as well. And then avoid any watering in December through early February. The what we found is that the growth rate is so slow there, the um, evapotranspiration of plants is so little that they really don't need much water. You're just kind of holding them on in a maybe a semi-dormant state. And then the last one that I have for, for this is that plants don't uh, robustly defend their older leaves. And so it can be helpful to remove them during harvest. So it's not an easy target for disease organisms. And so to illustrate what we do for that, um, one example of what we do, this is some lettuce that we've harvested, like a little bit of red lettuce on the left and um, uh, spritzer is the variety on the left and um, sycamore is the variety on the right. And you can see after we harvested it, like we got to harvest this, this at a pretty good time. There's some, a little bit of yellowing leaves underneath, but uh, uh, a good time to harvest it but there's just a huge amount of debris that's left behind. And so what we do after that is go through and just pull off as many of those old leaves as we can um, so that there's better airflow going through here and you can see the soil. If we were to have left it in this condition right here, uh, I can almost guarantee that most, if not all of these plants would be, um, would look like that first lettuce picture I showed and would not make it through to the spring. Uh, there's just too much opportunity, especially for lettuce, for this, um, for plants that look like this to uh, become overtaken by a variety of different diseases. And then in mid-February onward, when the plants are really growing, it's a little bit different, uh, different situation because we find that the fast rate of new growth tends to outpace most diseases. Um, so, at this point, it's uh, we try to apply sufficient water to facilitate fast plant growth. Uh, these plants need a lot more water now and um, benefit from it. Um, and it. And there's not as much of a risk of that water leading to a disease problem. So congratulations, you made it through the difficult time. Almost, because there are some diseases. This is um, a picture of white mold that uh, we find does uh, persist into the spring. Um, so it's not, there are, yeah, I guess we find that there are some, some diseases that, that still, uh, still need to be managed. White mold is a particularly difficult one um, because it uh, survives in the soil for a long time. Um, and as I understand, I haven't, it hasn't been a major problem on our farm, but, but I hear that it can be. So whenever we see white mold like this, we do our best to remove that material from the tunnel as, as soon as we can. And so the last I thought, I believe on disease is to uh, get to know each crop, its opportunities and challenges. This picture of red Russian kale is um, represents a different uh, mix, I guess, for our mustard green mix. We had grown some varieties before that um, had a more of a difficult uh, we're more susceptible to disease organisms. And it was just really neat to start growing red Russian kale and find like, wow, this really holds up. You can plant it really densely like this and, um, and it holds much better than many of those other greens that, um, that we would grow in our mescaline mix. So we've benefited from just trying a lot of things out and seeing what works well and uh, changing things based on our successes and failures. Any other questions that have come up, Colleen? Not on disease. Okay, so pests. Um, rodents are the biggest pests that we have in a high tunnel. Uh, the picture on the right is some spinach that was harvested and uh, the picture on the left would have looked like that were it not for rodents um, who, uh, who helped themselves. 
So you can see the traps. We have some snap traps on a board that works, um, can work okay. Uh, it does seem like they, the rodents start getting smarter about the traps though. And um, the longer they're in there, the less effectively they work. Um, you can see the little burrowing hole in this photo. And then um, cutworms are another pest that are new to us this year, these little worms here. We found them in our lettuce. And it had, wasn't a huge issue on our farm, but in being in touch with some folks from UVM Extension, it sounds like these can really be a huge problem on in winter greens. Um, difficult to control uh, with organic methods um, and has, they seem to have a really wide host range. So we're keeping our eyes out for these. Um, aphids was a question. Um, yep. Uh, I didn't. I don't have any slides on aphids, and I don't have any great tips for them. That's uh, that's something, a management aspect of our farm that uh, has room for improvement. We often have some aphids in our winter greens. Um, generally, they it's uh, generally the levels aren't high enough that it's a big problem, but occasionally it is. Um, and uh, I could share a little bit about what I've heard other people say about aphid management, but we don't have any any big uh, home runs for it. We just kind of get lucky some years and and not others. Yeah. So um, Richard um, says fall release of ladybugs helps a lot, um, and I'm just going to encourage our audience to um, if you have thoughts on aphids, go ahead and put it in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so cold damage is one of the other challenges to address. Uh, this is the variety koji, a uh, mustard green that um, that got damaged by the cold, even under row cover, uh, under three layers of row cover, the conditions were such that um, that these plants got damaged. And so one of the things that I wanted to share about cold damage is uh, something that, or I guess a realization that came to me, kind of a basic principle of um, Bio, uh, plant biology or horticulture, but it, it took me a little while to understand it, which is that there's not really such a thing as, um, or which is that hardiness is uh, is fluid and plants can be uh, hardy based on their environmental exposure. And so there's certain conditions that in, can encourage plants to be more or less hardy. And so the hardiness can be developed by in plants by exposure to uh, low temperatures, high airflow and low humidity. So these are the conditions that signal to a plant to like build their cells stronger. Um, and um, it, these conditions will slow the growth of plants and they'll also make them more resilient to cold temperatures. And so what, the way we think about establishing plants in our tunnels is to encourage these conditions in our plants as much as possible without exposing them to such low temperatures that their tissues get damaged. So we think about hardening off our winter greens in the fall. And the biggest way we do that is just by keeping the sides up as much as possible. That keeps the humidity down in the tunnel and uh, keeps the temperature down and exposes them to airflow. So that's um, the very first year we grew winter greens. We had, uh, you know, I, I planted them and I thought like, all right, let's grow some winter greens. And I tried to really keep it warm in there to like get these plants cranking. And, um, and that was not the right thing to do for disease pressure or the hardiness of what we were growing in there. So I wanted to share what uh, our row cover rules of thumb for mixed greens production. Um, so this is, keep in mind the crops that we have are kind of a variety of crops and rather than a single crop in a tunnel. Um, so if you have a single crop, you might find um, you, you might find different uh, different temperatures that might be necessary to do. Uh, but this is just kind of what we stick with as uh, a basic framework. So when outdoor temperatures are 24 degrees or below, we have at least one layer of row cover over plants. If it's 15 degrees or below, we have at least two layers. And if it's single digits or below, we have at least three layers of row cover. And then spinach is the kind of the notable exception that it is significantly hardier than uh, the other greens in our crop mix. So I think spinach, um, if I had a tunnel full of spinach, I would adjust these, but I haven't tried that yet. So I'm not sure by how much, 
um, but maybe there's if anyone has um, uh, has the tunnels full of just spinach, it would be neat to neat to hear what other folks are doing as far as row cover and and layers based on temperature. And then um, the other thing to share about row cover is I really learned to think not just about this the one night ahead of me, but also what the next few days are going to look be look like as far as row cover, um, because I know that if it's going to be cloudy the next day then uh, then there'll be very little um, energy going into the very little heat energy going into the system. And so I, I would hesitate if it's going to be 25 degrees and then there's going to be a cloudy day and then it's going to drop down into the teens or single digits. I would just go ahead and cover it up on that 25 degree night because I wouldn't want things to be lightly frozen in here and then not thaw out and then go into a very cold period. Um, so I'm always looking, I'm always trying to look ahead to see what, um, is there going to be sun coming that's going to warm things back up and thaw out any lightly frozen plants or is there, um, or is it going to stay cloudy and cold and do I need to try to keep in as much heat as possible to prevent the plants from freezing? I think maybe one thing I should just add as I'm thinking of it is that the goal is not to keep plants from freezing, um, because all the plants that that we're growing under here can handle some some amount of freezing for um, for a certain amount of time. Um, so light freezes are okay. It's when they have really hard freezes um, or especially consecutive nights of of very hard freezes that that the the plants will not be able to recover their damage their tissue from it. So there was a question about hoops and I don't, it's something that we're still trying, kind of figuring out on our farm, I guess. Um, uh, we, the hoops that we use are wire hoops. They're like 76 inches long. We purchased them through Nolts Greenhouse Supply. Brookdale Fruit Farm also sells, um, sells uh, pre-made hoops for tunnels like these. They're like, they're lightweight and easy to move around. They, our beds are 36 inches wide and they cover them pretty well. Um, mostly what I use hoops for is to kind of define an area to bundle our row cover up. So we have huge sheets of row, you know, you can see that the row cover that we have here is one single sheet that covers up the whole tunnel. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to do it either. Next year, we're going to try doing what many other farms do of using uh, a few pieces of row cover. So next year, we'll have three narrower pieces. So one piece will cover two beds, another piece will cover two beds, etc which may make it a little easier to uncover and recover it, but we're looking forward to figuring that out. Um, but I don't have, with so yeah, that's something we're still figuring out. The one thing that hoops are very useful for, for us is to kind of define a space for the row cover to go when it's uncovered. So, um, you know, you can imagine when we uncover this tunnel, kind of in this bed along here where this line of the row cover is, we might pull the right side over and deposit it in here and the left side we might pull over and drop it in here too. I think the hoops are handy to keep um, keep that row cover confined rather than really covering the beds next to it. Um, but I don't have any particularly strong opinions about whether or not the row cover should be right on the plants or off the plants. It seems to work okay either way for us. But, um, there's seems like there's there may be a lot of experience in the in the group and it'd be great to hear any other thoughts on that from other other growers any other questions for now colleen yeah we had a question earlier about what percent of days do you need to cover your greens during the winter do you have an idea of that for us i think they're mostly covered um uh in the yeah for, uh, for days i mean uh yeah for nights, it's almost every night that they get covered up this time of the year. You know, we have a warm spell coming up, so I'm excited to have them uncovered for a few days and a few nights in a row. But um, uh, I would say that we often leave, our crew is only here one or two days a week. And um, I often feel like I have more important things to do than to take row cover on and off. So on days when I when it might be helpful to take it on, if, if we don't have a crew working here, I generally won't go out and uncover it. So they're uncovered a lot of the time and we might have, we might grow better greens and have better, um, you know, uh, 
might have less disease pressure if we were more diligent about uncovering our tunnels during the day. Okay, so that was another question um, about uncovery, uncovering just to ventilate. Um, so I'm going to add to it, um, is there a certain amount of time that or conditions where it's covered where you start to worry and say, I've really got to ventilate these? No, I don't think so. I, I, at least I don't think that way, but I'm, I'm sure others might. Um, okay. uh, it, it's, there probably is a certain amount of time where it's like, oh, we really got to get some airflow through here. Um, I, haven't in, I haven't dove in deep enough to, to think about that. I just um, uncover it when it's, I, I suppose I uncover it when it's convenient. All right. Um, and then just so you know, there's um, some good information getting dropped in the chat about spinach and it's awesome. winter and covering I look this. forward to checking that out. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like I was saying, the worst case scenario is consecutive nights of extreme cold with cloudy days in between. And that's a situation where I think it can be really useful to have backup, uh, backup heat. Um, if just a, a little propane heater or something to put a little heat in those tunnels on the very coldest nights to try to prevent uh, plants from getting damaged. Um, and then cut it, what we try to do is cut back the unmarketable leaves uh, because a plant mustard greens like this will regrow really well in the spring if we just get all that um, all those damaged leaves out of the way. So operator error. This was the last the last one uh, the last challenge to manage. I'll just go through operator error on our farm. I might speed up a little bit just so we have time for some questions at the end and I can get through all the crop specific information. So not diligent about recording precise seed dates to dial in best practices. Like often that in the fall, it's a kind of busy, I'll seed things and I may not um, be as precise as I'd like to about the exact date that I did. Um, and I've learned it really pays to, um, to be very precise with those so that we can learn from it. Uh, if we have a plan to seed a certain crop at a certain time and we miss those seeding dates in the sea of other late summer responsibilities, you know, if you, if you miss that date, you've missed your opportunity to get that crop uh, seeded on time. We have almost forgotten to cover up our tunnels after a warm spell. So if we get to leave them uncovered for a few nights, we, um, my wife Kara and I try to be really diligent to make sure that we don't just space out and leave them uncovered when we get a hard freeze because um, that would be a huge operator error. Um, we have, however, needed to cover up tunnels uh, late some nights after the row cover has started to freeze to itself. Um, that's, not, that's not much fun and not good for a marriage. And we, um, I guess another mistake we've done is leaving, leaving tunnels uncovered on a cool night, followed by a cloudy day, followed by a hard freeze. One thing we did learn that works well in a situation where if you might have partially frozen greens going into a cold night, putting a little irrigation on them um, uh, really helped uh, avoid, avoid damage, putting irrigation on and then covering them up. So here is the crop specific production information for spinach. The varieties of spinach that we grow are Colibri and Oroch. They both have high uh, downy mildew resistance. Uh, it seems to me like races 12 through 15 are the ones that tend to show up. So if I was going to try a new variety of spinach, I would try to make sure that it's resistant to 12 to 15 or maybe even 12 to 16. And there's a lot of spinach varieties that are recommended for winter production. These are just the two that we happen to do, but I'm, I know that there's many, many more good ones out there. Um, this is another neat thing that we like to do with spinach is we grow these oversized onion sets in between them. You can see they're planted really densely in between the rows. Uh, the ones that are laid out are waiting to be stuck in the soil. And those are, um, we get those from Nolt's Produce Supply oversized onion set, they're called. And it's really cool to plant these in between spinach. Um, we plant those on November 1st, and, uh, and then we harvest them in April. The spinach, uh, when we direct seed spinach, we can direct seed it a little later than the ones we do for transplant. Uh, from uh, September 7th to September 14th is our window for direct seeding. Um, uh, yes, and then transplanting, we seed those in trays 
If we're going to transplant them, we see them in trays a little earlier because there's that break in growth when you stick the transplant in the ground and the roots have to reorganize themselves a little bit. So, um, and then what we found for transplanting spinach, if we seed them in trays, we need to set traps for rodents or else the rodents are uh, remarkably good at finding every single spinach seed in the tray. And then here's what it looks like in the spring with those onion sets growing up uh, among the spinach. It does slow down harvest a little bit, um, but it's really cool to have those uh, scallions in the spring. So we pick spinach by hand to try to have the fastest regrowth. Uh, spinach is extremely cold hardy. Uh, if you select for downy mildew resistance, then in our experience, there seems to be less disease issues with spinach than many salad mixes. You can harvest all through uh, April, uh, really good production in March and April, popular and delicious in the winter. And it does require an earlier tunnel transition to direct seed spinach. Uh, so that means you need to get your tomatoes or whatever out of the ground a little earlier, but you can do a later transition if you transplant the spinach in. Spinach is attractive to rodents and, um, and it's kind of, if you grow spinach, you're probably not going to grow another late spring crop, you're probably just going to grow spinach. Um, scallions are really great, but it does slow down the spinach harvest a little bit to have those kind of in the way. For mustard greens, the varieties we grow are Tokyo Bacana that we direct seed uh, October 1st through 4th. Koji is a darker green mustard green. We direct seed September 30th through October 2nd. KX1 is a red kale. Uh, we direct seed uh, September 27th through September 29th. And red Russian kale, we also direct seed September 27th through the 29th. Arugula is um, October 1st through 4th when we, when we try to seed that. And then the cool thing about these is you can reseed them anytime in January through March and they grow really well like that. Um, so some pros cons is that uh, the mustard greens really seem to not like dense plantings. Um, or if, if you do plant them densely, you need to harvest them promptly, except the, the kales. It's the first crop to hit the growth spurt in February. The regrowth is really has good quality in the spring. It makes a really nice mix. In mid-March, uh, mid-March maturity may allow succession planting. So if you grow these, if you, if you plant this in the fall, you might be able to squeeze in one more crop after it, after it's done producing. Uh, there's a really high demand for salad mix in the winter, uh, but it's susceptible to cold damage while plants are awaiting their first cutting. So if you have it sitting around in your tunnel in December or January, we often get cold damage on our mustard greens. And then the damage leaves makes it a lot, take a lot longer to harvest. So here's some Tokyo Bacana that we seeded in mid-January. So you can see like a month later, it's like just barely germinated. Um, but then in early March, you can see on the, the two beds on the left are spinach and kale that were just seeded. And then that bed of um, mustard greens that was seeded January is um, sizing up a little bit. And then by mid-April on the right, we've harvested those mustard greens from the, from the January planting. And the spinach and kale on the left are growing up. You might be ready to harvest in another couple weeks. For uh, baby lettuce, we don't grow a lot of varieties. We grow Sulu, Sycamore, Clearwater, Spritzer, and Sealinet, but there are many more other varieties. And um, it seems like downy mildew resistance is a good, good to look for. And then I find you just have to test varieties for cold tolerance. We direct seed baby lettuce on September 11th through the 17th. And then this is that lettuce in April, um, putting on a lot of growth. So I find that lettuce has a really high yield potential because you can get a really a nice uh, big fall harvest, a single fall harvest, and then you can get two or maybe even three more cuttings in uh, March through April. Lettuce has it does have extremely slow winter growth, so you're not going to not going to get it'll be the last the last green to regrow for the second cutting, and it is susceptible to many diseases and aphids. Some years we have a really high winter mortality um, because of the diseases that affect lettuce and we'll have a real patchy bed for the spring. Mini heads are a new one. Um, oops. 
Mini heads are a new one that we've grown. Um, we've just tried the variety new them. Uh, so we don't have a lot of new ham, perhaps. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience growing mini heads, um, but it was really cool to grow this. This is our first year growing these and we seeded them August 20th. There was a short harvest window with spacing as dense as this photo. They really started to um, require a lot of peeling off leaves. Uh, you know, a couple weeks after we started harvest. But one of the things that's neat about this is that you harvest this crop and then you have this wide open space that you can plant for uh, spring succession. For bunched kale, um, let's see, we seed those in trays August 15th. We transplant them at eight inches to a one foot. Uh, bunch kale does need tall hoops to accommodate row covers. So those hoops, I'm, those little metal hoops that I mentioned before would not be adequate to be able to get get the row cover up and over this kale. So these, this is half inch PVC that we put over these. And you can see that the nature of the hoops um, and the kale kind of burned up the walkway in the middle. So we mostly harvest this from the outside edges. There's Kale has fairly slow winter growth, but it's a good choice for stockpiling. You can really grow a lot of kale and store a lot of kale to pick down in January. And the, one of the things that we find with kale is that you just have to pick off the yellowing and dead leaves from the bottom of the plants as you go. So often we'll have kale growing outside that um, that we are we're harvesting kale in our tunnel while we still have kale growing outside just so that we can get the lower leaves off of this tunnel kale. Otherwise, if we harvest all our outdoor kale first and then turn to this, it's a little bit of a mess because we have a ton of yellow leaves on the bottom of these plants and we just have to remove so much of it. Um, so we try to kind of pick pick off the first six or eight leaves of the plant um, early before they start to turn yellow. Some other crops are bok choy, hakura turnip, and radishes. This is bok choy that we have transplanted, and then as it's getting ready, as it's getting ready to be harvested. So shuko is a variety that we really like for bok choy. We get that through Fedco seeds. It's a it's a mini it's a small bok choy, and um, we've been growing that for a lot of years and are just really like it. Um, we seed it in trays on September 10th and transplant early October at six inch spacing. We do a spring spring plantings of bok choy too, seeded anytime in January through March. And then for the fall planting, um, you can harvest it, you know, as soon as it reaches maturity, but it also does seem to do all right, kind of being held in the tunnel as long as it doesn't get too cold that it um, damages the plant. And then bok choy is another one where you kind of have a neat opportunity to clear out this whole patch and then plant a spring succession in it. Salad turnips and radishes are, we don't grow those in the fall uh, because there's just not as much demand in the fall and we can, there's more demand for other things we could grow in the tunnel, but it makes a neat um, spring planting. So we seed those in January through March and transplant either in empty beds or another way we like to grow these is as in this photo where we have our tomatoes planted in here, we'll plant them right along the edges of those beds and get be able to harvest a lot of greens uh, from that tomato tunnel. The trade-off, of course, as you can see in here, is that our tomatoes don't have a lot of airflow early on. Um, so that's always a concern when we do this. But it's neat to be able to harvest all these, all these crops er much earlier than we otherwise could. Um, so then chard, we seed August 20th and transplant it six inches apart. We harvest it November through April. And chard is a really good yielding plant for us. It does grow more, more than some other plants through the winter. And it has a nice long harvest season. So it, it grows really robustly and takes a long time to, to go to seed. So you can really harvest it well into April. And then pea shoots are one of my favorite little things to have in our tunnel. Um, we seed them the latest later than any other crop. So it's very valuable to have as a, a late seeded um, option, October 25th through November 1st. It has um, latest fall planting window. And so it makes it a great option to cover up any mistakes like germination issues, transplant shortages, or missed seeding dates. Pea shoots are kind of the last thing where we can go in and say like, oh, do we have any space in the tunnel that didn't work out the way we thought it would? And then we can uh, get pea shoots established there. I didn't write the variety down, but 4010 is uh, 4010 field pea is the variety that we really like for this. 
for pea shoots. Um, and it also has the latest spring planting window. So you can seed pea shoots January through April. And in when it starts really getting warm in the tunnels in March through April, it's just three weeks to maturity with pea shoots. So if you have a nice little window in the fall where you have an empty bed for a few weeks before you're gonna get your summer crops planted in there, you, you have an opportunity to seed pea shoots in there where pretty much any other green, there wouldn't be enough time to make, the, to make that work. And another neat thing about pea shoots is you can sell them on their own um, or you can mix them in with salad mixes if we, if we have too many. And the regrowth on pea shoots is possible, but um, not reliable for us. Um, so I think um, I wanted to, I, I had some slides about growing some protected greens outdoors um, uh, in the fall to uh, complement tunnel harvest, but I think it might make sense to, um, to end now and see if there's any, any questions or discussion that we want to have at the end. Yeah, so we have a couple questions that were lingering and I'm gonna encourage you guys to add any more questions that you have for him now. Um, let's see. Um, I'll read them as they, this one as it was written. Uh, your hoop houses are very large. Is there a size factor in the temp humidity and what's the smallest hoop house that would work in our climate? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to it because we've mostly just grown in larger hoop houses. Um, I do know that the edges of our tunnels, um, uh, the soil is colder in the edges. And so the growth is a little slower on the edges compared to the center. Um, but I guess years ago, we did grow in a winter greens in a little caterpillar tunnel. Um, and it, it can be done in our climate. Um, in a, you know, that was, eight or 10 feet wide. Um, and I would just, I think I would just kind of start with, uh, start with the hardiest greens in there. Um, I would, you know, probably start with spinach and see, uh, you know, uh, or mostly spinach and try a few other things. Um, but I think the smaller, the smaller the tunnel, uh, the less, um, you know, the more exposure to the, the outside environment there is, um, the, the less buffering against that. Um, so I don't have any, I don't have much definitive to say on that, but it's definitely worth trying. All right. And then- other folks, um, sorry, other folks may have more to chime in about that. Yeah, and then um, we'll see. We'll see, I'll let you know if anything um, comes up in the chat, other folks ch um, chiming in about that. Um, we had someone asking about um, why they experience kale tasting sweeter um, in the winter um, and what would make the summer um, outside grown kale be a little more bitter. I think as I understand that, I think the plants respond to, uh, to cold temperatures by um, producing more sugars to store in their tissues and that makes them uh, a little more protected from freezing. Uh, so spinach and kale, I think is where it's uh, the most noticeable where those plants are really um, have the ability to be much, much sweeter in the winter than they do in the summer. All right, and um, Susan Long um, did chime in and say, that the more square your hoop house, the better, um, less edge versus interior space and long and thin is not good for midwinter. Um, and then Ryan, what are you using to direct seed? Um, this question was particularly lettuce, um, but maybe there is more to add there. Yeah, we use, we direct seed almost all of our, um, greens with a jang seeder. I think for lettuce, we use the, uh, uh, the XY roller, the one with a little cross, a little cross in it. Um, I believe it's XY and XY24. And we uh, have the front sprocket is 11 and the rear is 13. Um, it, uh, that's what we do for, for lettuce. One other thing, maybe I'll just jump in with, um, I did want to touch on 
one little thing, um, which is that often in presentations like these about winter greens growing, the washing and bagging part is not discussed. Um, and that's that's a really important part of doing this because you have to, you know, process you have to have a space that you can wash and bag these greens in. For um, for a few years, we just did it in the end of our, our high tunnel and just tried to wash and bag in sunny days at the end of our tunnel, which worked, but is um, is not ideal. And it kind of got muddy and uh, there's not enough space to store bins. Um, what we I was really happy that we uh, came up with a very low cost solution that works great. This is our wash station on the side of our barn. And in the winter, we just put a little framing up and have this uh, strapping on here to put some greenhouse plastic on. You can see a little chimney coming out of the side. And on the inside, um, this is pre-COVID before we were all wearing masks for, the, for these things. Uh, here's Taylor washing greens with a barrel stove in there. And uh, it just works great. It We hired, you know, we paid a local guy 500 bucks to get the, to do the carpentry work in a hurry for us one fall. And um, we got a barrel stove for $75 and it just works so great to um, have a simple solution like this uh, for washing and bagging. Um, so I, I just thought that was a, something worth sharing because for a long time I thought that we would need to spend a whole lot of money to, you know, have an insulated space with, uh, you know, that never freezes and it's great to find something inexpensive in between that works really well for it. So I just wanted to add that in uh, before before we ended. And yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Um, I, I would like to ask this last question from uh, Nolan Hurley. Uh, what percent of farm income comes from hoop house growing? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I have that number handy right in front of me. I know when Becky put those uh, soil sensors in, we really tracked it. And I think um, uh, that I guess that was 20, 2017, I think. Um, that we, in our two, at the time we had two, you know, 45 square, 4,500 square foot tunnels. And they each produced, yeah, I think that it was in the range between 17 and maybe $21,000 of, of gross sales per tunnel for winter greens. Um, I don't have, I don't have the number handy for, uh, for our whole farm. We have about four acres of production and our three greenhouses. If I had to guess, I would maybe say 20%, um, but that's just a guess. And that's for summer and winter growing in those tunnels. Right. Um, that's awesome. We've got a lot of good feedback um, coming in. And um, I'm gonna wrap us up. I'm gonna say thank you so much, Ryan. This is- Oh, Colleen, can I just share one more, one last thing? Oh, go ahead, I, yeah. I forgot I had this last slide, thank you. Of course. And the last thing I just wanted to add is, um, I, you know, maybe this came through, but I just, uh, uh, don't take my word for it. Your own observations are essential. And I think the best way to do winter greens is um, to like take in information like this and maybe it'll make you think and maybe it'll help you uh, kind of diagnose and solve problems and evaluate successes. But I think the key is to set yourself up to learn as effectively as you can from your mistakes and successes. And this is a part of uh, agriculture in general, but especially winter growing, I think, really benefits from um, just uh, engaging in understanding what's going on and learning. And that's one of the things that's, that's really, that's fun about it. And, um, and that, that's, that's all. And also my emails here. If anyone has any questions, feel free to send me an email. And thanks for thanks for coming and checking it out. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I this has been a great presentation and there's a lot of um, thank yous coming in on the chat. Um, we remember we have support today for this workshop um, from UVM risk management education and are sharing a few links in the chat um, with resources that might help you. So that's gonna be um, risk management um, for crops um, information for you. Um, we also appreciate your feedback on this session. You'll see the link in the chat for a short survey. Um, please fill this out and let us know how this workshop went for you. Uh, this feedback helps us improve our offerings each year and we really value hearing from you. Thanks for coming today, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you soon at some of our other conference events.